What's in there? It's suction tubes, surgical instruments, saws, drills, power equipment, um, and uh, all of the devices that we need to put facial bones back together again. Every departure has a story, but this one stands out. Dr. Ole Antonician is a reconstructed plastic surgeon from Toronto, bound for Ukraine and packing a special cargo. Are you excited? Can't wait. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I really am. I really am. I think it's going to be a, a very worthwhile trip. I think we're going to be very productive. Can't wait to get there. He and a team, 25 surgeons, doctors and nurses from across the country, are on a mission to reconstruct a revolution, the damaged and wounded people left behind by war. Siba Haikal says goodbye to her fiance. She's a fourth year resident surgeon on her first ever mission. I've been wanting to do reconstructive surgery since I was a child. So I'm really happy that finally I get a chance to do this, but also to give back. This mission is organized by the Canada-Ukraine Foundation and Operation Rainbow. Some have volunteered before, but few are fully prepared, it turns out, for the emotional upheaval that comes with the casualties of war. <laughs> Nearly a year ago, central Kiev was in flames. A brutal struggle between young protesters and the government of Viktor Yanukovych playing out violently in Independent Square. During the harsh winter, People armed with paving stones faced up against well-fortified security police. As tensions ratcheted up last February, explosions ripped through the labor union building. Ivan Derzilo's son was inside. I can still see it in my mind, all these horrible memories of what happened last February. Nazar Dazilo was 16. He'd snuck out to follow his older brother to Maidan. I was feeling patriotic. I sincerely wanted to go there. Nazar was helping a friend inside what was a makeshift medical station. Roman came with a box of medications. He started to open it and it exploded. After that, I don't remember a lot. The police phoned and said, your son's a terrorist. They said he lost his hands, he lost his arms, and he's not going to survive. It was the most terrible night of my life. Nazar didn't lose his limbs. He was blinded in one eye. Today, he's undergoing one more surgery preparations for a new prosthetic eye under the care of Dr. Antonician. I operated to make the eye look less sunken and uh, more natural, match his other eye as close as he possibly could. So we've done some surgery to reconstruct the socket to accommodate prosthesis. And we've done surgery to reconstruct his upper eyelid so that it looks fuller and looks like his uninjured eyelid. And, um, and it looks very much better. So I'll come back on Saturday, I'll take all the dress things down and we'll see what it looks like in the end. Kiev's military hospital is overwhelmed with casualties. 2,500 trauma cases here alone, many requiring multiple surgeries. And as the revolution in Kiev subsides, a different kind of war moves to eastern Ukraine. The fight against pro-Russian separatists, sending battlefield casualties here. Some of those severely wounded fighters end up on the Canadian team's case list. Like Andriy Yusach, father, husband, 33 years old. Back in February, he'd felt guilty watching people getting shot on Maidan. So by spring, he'd signed up to fight separatists in the east. In July, he got caught, trapped by heavy shelling around Luhansk airport. Uh, I was running, then I suddenly fell. When I looked behind me, I saw my leg. The next thing I remember, a handful of doctors and nurses giving me first aid. They were cutting off my leg. Immobilized for days, surrounded in the battlefield, he was nearly killed by another rocket. 
In that moment, I was ready to say goodbye to life. I didn't think I'd be saved, but I guess something needed me to live. Andrei needs reconstructive surgery on his jaw and for his hand. A prosthetic leg will have to wait. His complex injuries are typical of the challenges facing the Canadian team. Resident Siba Heikel assisted on Andrei's surgery. When they were injured initially, it was a matter of acute making sure that their heart was okay, their lungs were okay, they were breathing fine. What we're doing here, we're giving them either better hand function or we're making sure that, you know, their face is well fitted for prosthetic. We're making sure, you know, they can look in the mirror and be happy. Uh, so I think that's, you know, sometimes we underestimate the value of that. The Canadian team, working with Ukrainian surgeons and staff, assess more than 60 patients. They carry out 37 operations, moving between two beds in one room, a third in another. A majority of cases are technically complex, from skull and jaw reconstructions to scar revisions. Roman likes his results so much he hugs his surgeon, Dr. Tara Stewart. There's four rooms saying inpatient. One of them has a patient in there. Nurse Dolly Kana helps organize the caseload. Imperative to do as much as they can in a short 10 days. We have to give ongoing help. So other teams can come and do rehabilitation or, or more prostheses or just help them get back in society and be able to have a job and have a living because this is leaving them with nothing. It's too young to... Too young to go through this. There are critical wounds. Patient Alexander Kovalchuk took a bullet to his head last August. Surgeons repair his skull defect using grafts of titanium mesh. There's no bleeding on the surface of the brain. We've used titanium mesh and we've formed it to fit absolutely perfectly into that defect to reconstruct, reconstruct uh, continuity of the skull and get a normal shape. This is one of the toughest operations and it's a success. One day later, Alexander gets a checkup by Dr. Ulana Kaun. He wears the bullet dug out of his skull as an amulet and tells her he's deeply grateful. But there is always more need than time, and these doctors can't immediately heal the mental wounds. So we are leaving European Square. Nearing the end, the medical team finally sheds their gowns and gloves to tour the now famous ground, Maidan. Thousands of students, millions of people came. Today, the barricades are gone, the tents and tires moved away, replaced with martyrs and memories. Now, with adrenaline seeping out and fatigue creeping in, the emotions break free. Very symbolic. Yeah. Nadia Wachola is a nurse from Edmonton. I must tell you, um, it was most humbling to see the soldiers. Um, they so much appreciated our help. Um, it's an experience of a lifetime. It is life changing. We will not forget it. They are so thankful to us. On the last afternoon at the hospital, a memento, signed by Ukrainian staff and patients. Dr. Antonishin takes pride in the still smiling Nazar post-surgery. This boy is actually one of the main things that made me personally want to come to Ukraine. Back home, the medical team which set out to help mend a country have themselves been transformed, touched to a person, surgeon Dr. Kuhn. We're very sad to go, but very happy to be back. I'm sure it was an emotional experience. It was. It was. Yeah, no, it, was, it was wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm so proud of, of, of the whole team, how we work together. You know, it's, it's as if we're from the same soul. For Ziba Haikal, reunited with her fiancé. 
her first mission gave her far more than she'd ever dreamed. There's so much that we can still do and there's so much to do. Um, and I think we sort of just started. It was definitely uh, very challenging and uh, you know, it was uh, extremely gratifying. There is a spirit here, a sense this isn't the end, more like just a beginning. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Toronto.